Good morning. There may be some of you who remember almost one year ago, Old Second Thread thought it would be a good idea to taunt the Code Force's gods by saying that tourists could be viewed as anything less than the most powerful programmer to ever walk among us. And since then, they have enacted revenge upon him by demoting him from nearly international grandmaster down to grandmaster, down to international master, and even down to master. He suffered a great many defeats across many contests, lost his red, went all the way down from not only orange down to yellow. But he has fought his way back and valiantly returned to red. And today, he has competed in yet another rated Code Forces contest. As the road to LGM continues, we are one year in, and I hope you've enjoyed Halloween yet again. We have the same Christmas decorations. We've got the same posters. We have the same lights. But things have changed. Not only do we have a new mic, uh, we've got a new haircut and a new chair and a new computer as well. So if you remember this video, I hope you'll enjoy this one as well. Since then, we have dropped and we've recovered to Grandmaster. And today, we've been the highest we've been in almost a year, unlike the meta stock price. We are almost yet again at International Grandmaster range. This was quite a good contest for me, I'm going to be honest. And we're going to talk about it in this video. I will quit the intro here and let live second thread take you through what the contest was like, what I was thinking, and I'll interrupt with some solutions to the problems partway through. We got a Code Forces round. This is round 831. Uh, we also have some Halloween decorations in the background. Because it's Halloween, I might remind you of the, the time Road to LGM started. Well, we're continuing it here with round 831. It's a Div 1 plus Div 2. We're going to jump into the contest. It's rated for me, and we're going to hope to get some rating back here. Problem A. It's also very late at night for me. It's almost 2.30 in the morning. We've got a prime number N. N. Find a prime number M such that that's not prime. Okay. If it's 2, we pick 7. Otherwise, we pick 3. Can they be the same? Uh, if n is equal to 7, if n is not equal to 7, print 7, else, out dot print line, what if it's 7, 5? I think we're fine. So 5 for 7, okay, submit a. All right, even easier way of doing this, which I didn't notice, just print 7 every time. Uh, 7 plus any prime number will not be prime. The reason for that is that the only even prime number is 2. 2 plus 7 is 9, which isn't prime because it's 3 times 3. And any other prime number is going to be odd. Obviously, if the number was even, it would have a factor of 2. And an odd number plus 7 is going to be even because 7 is odd, right? Any two odd numbers added together is even. So you just print 7 for every test case, and that'll be correct. Okay, we got it. All right, on to B. Oh, my goodness, so many problems. Okay. Two-dimensional slices of cheese. The i th oh, this is also a really long contest. Oh boy, I'm gonna be up so late. The i th slice of cheese is represented by a rectangle of dimensions a by b. We want to arrange them on a two-dimensional plane such that each edge of cheese is parallel to either the x-axis or the y-axis. The bottom edge of cheese is a segment of the x-axis. None of them overlap. Their sides can touch. They form a connected shape. We can arrange them in any order. Also, find the minimum possible perimeter. So just sort them. Oh, wait. Interesting. You can do this. Oh, this is invalid. Yeah, so it's just the max height. And then what do you output? The perimeter. It's been impossible perimeter. So all that matters is the max and then the sum of x's. Um, Q 
can you rotate? We can rotate you to let's shift G's. Okay. So um, you probably, you always want the bigger one vertical, right? Because you might not have to pay for that. Yeah, and then you want the sum of the smaller and then the max bigger. Okay. Um, all right, what is the input? Sorry, we'll make this nice and big for everyone. What does the input look like? So I'll explain the solution I needed to this while I code it. The idea is we want the cheeses to be ordered either like an increasing or decreasing order, assuming we already know the rotation. And if we do that, then the total cost, the total perimeter, will be the sum of the x values plus the maximum y value times 2. Where this comes from is if we look at the horizontal component of the parameter and the vertical components, the vertical components add up to the biggest y value if we have these cheeses sorted optimally. Uh, and the horizontal components are just all of the horizontal components on the top and bottom of each cheese. So the observation here when we need to choose the rotation is that we actually want each cheese to be tall because we definitely have to pay for the horizontal component, but we might not have to pay for the vertical component. So it's always better for the cheeses to be tall rather than wide. And my goodness, bells at eye. VS Code, will you stop it? Thank you. Bells at I plus one uh, times two, right? Because you got to go top and bottom, and then ants plus equals max times two, and then out dot print line max, or the ants, sorry. Let's try this. Twenty-six, twenty-four, one thirty-four. All right, looks good. Let's submit to B, and then I'll make this bigger for people too. We'll move on to C. Bricks and bags. Um, there are n bricks numbered one to n. Brick I has weight A I. This person has three bags numbered from one to three that are initially empty. For each brick, this person must put it into one of the bags. After this, each bag, wait, what, we have three bricks? Or, oh, you put each brick into a bag and each bag must contain at least one brick, okay. After this person distributes the brick, this person will take exactly one brick from each bag. Let WJ be the weight this person takes from bag J. The score is calculated as the difference between the first two weights, the difference between, or plus the difference between the next two. So you pick the bricks from the bags to minimize the score. What's the maximum possible final score Okay, so, man, can they not pick, like, English names? Alice and Bob would be great, or just, like, at least something starts with A, something starts with B. would be fantastic. So you want to maximize the score, and this person wants to minimize it. So the first thing that I try and do here is just put almost all the bricks in the third pile by going from min to max to second max, or going from max to min to second min. But it turns out you can actually do better if your piles are 1, 2, 9, 10, for instance. 10, you can do better, right? So what if you do 1, 9, 9, 10, and then 2? Then this is 8 plus 7. So you can do better. So the complete way of handling this is you have your first element in its own group, and then you have a continuous range of groups, which you brute force, and then you have everything else. And you can calculate how much that contributes in order one time, and you can also do the reverse. So you can have a big group, and then everything else, and then just your last element. And those are the only two options that you need to consider. This one. 15. So this is 8 plus 7 is 15. Okay, what about this one? Yeah, that's all right, I think. I also found a bug in code forces here. It turns out it doesn't accept submissions that have a curly brace in a comment before the main method. Uh, the regex that Mike wrote is just not quite right. So there you go. Okay, that's a little annoying. All right, that's C. How are we doing? Not terribly. Top 150 or so. 
Although we do have a wrong answer, which is unfortunate. But we can live with that. Okay. Uh, let's read D and E, I guess. All right, so this was pretty hard for me to understand in contest, so I'll explain it here instead. So you've got this animation, which explains it pretty well, but basically you have a series of cards. Initially, they're all stacked in the top left-hand corner of a grid, and you want to move all the cards to the bottom right-hand corner of the grid, and that's what's happening here. There are some additional rules. In order to move a card, you can only move it to an adjacent space, either down, left, up, or right, and also you can't stack any cards anywhere except the bottom right corner and the initial stack on the top left. And you also can't move any cards into the top left space or have any cards leave the bottom right space. And the question is, can you finish them in a stack where the smallest number is on the top, the biggest number is on the bottom, and they're sorted? In this animation, you're given the initial order of the stack, so three is on the top, and then you have six. So it can be in any order, and you're given this an input. And then, uh, yeah, for instance, they, they put some cards, they store them temporarily on the grid, but eventually everything winds up in the bottom right-hand corner. So this is an example where it's possible. You don't have to show how to do it, you just have to print whether or not it's possible to do somehow. I think you effectively just have n spaces to w work with, or like whichever is bigger maybe, the row or the column. Um, let me think. Yeah, what matters is like how many, how many spaces can we use. I think I've seen something like this a while ago. Yeah, it's like, how, it's like, can you do a slider puzzle to get everything in place? Yeah, you can do six. So you have one, as long as you have one free space, you can like slider puzzle the thing that you want into the finish. We can check this pretty easily. So we just need, yeah, we, we're going to iterate through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One has to be in the first X things that are alive. Then we'll delete one then in the next x things that are alive we need yeah so we're going to need a bit i think that's it all right so in case you didn't get that i'll explain the solution while i'm coding it at 2x speed here we're going to start with the biggest card we're going to move that to the finish and then we're going to do the second biggest card and so on but we might run into the problem that if we're trying to move like the biggest card for instance there might be other cards on top of it in the starting stack and all of those cards we would have to move to intermediate waiting squares before we can access this bottom card or this biggest card. Now, when we do this, we might want to know, well, how many waiting squares can we afford to use? And since our grid has width times height spaces, it turns out we can use width times height minus three of these uh, at any given time. And the reason it's minus three is because obviously we can't use the, the top left starting square and the bottom right ending square, but we also can't use one of the squares in the middle because we need these things in the middle to be able to move around still. We don't just have to get this biggest square off the top we have to get it to the finish, so it requires this empty space. And the proof that it's possible is basically we just treat it like a slider puzzle. So we have the one empty square, we keep moving cards to its position, and then we move the empty square to where it needs to be, and then we can make a small amount of progress with the next the next card that has to move to the finish. Um, so how do we actually code this? How do we actually see if at any point there would be too many waiting cards? Well, we can use a Fenwick tree, and this will store a one at a particular position, if this card in the stack, in the initial stack, has not yet been moved to the finish. And then once we move a, uh, a card to the finish, so we'll start with the, the card with label n, we'll move that to the finish, then n minus 1, and so on. When we move something to the finish, we'll update the position in that Fenwick tree or, or bit binary index tree. We'll set that index to 0. So then a range sum in this bit will tell us how many things are still alive and also were above us in the initial stack. And we know all of those things would have to be occupying waiting squares, so this tells us if we ever have too many waiting squares occupied at a time. Yeah, if possible. So the second one isn't possible, this one is possible? Oh, because we're not doing, I'm doing it in the wrong order. Um, yeah, so this is really n minus. Yeah, okay. I haven't seen anything like this problem before, actually. The one I've seen like it, it involves moving things on a grid, but it's it's completely different. Nice, all right, cool, cool, cool. Sorry, that was way too much hype. For, for how easy that problem was, yeah, there's 
but 35th place. I'm happy with that. Okay. Um, let's do the real problems now. Contest starts here. We got our five problems set. We have A through D out of our heads, and this is where we start on problem A here. Um, Pat Chinek has a has N blank heart-shaped cards. Lots of cards here, and lots of weird names. Okay. Card one is attached directly to the wall, while each of the other cards is hanging onto one other card by a piece of string. Okay, card one is on the wall. Every other card is attached to presumably the one before it. Oh, apparent. So we have like a tree. Okay. In the very beginning, we must write one integer number on each card. Okay. He does this by choosing a permutation of A, and then he writes something on each thing. Okay, so we've got a different number on each card. All right. After that, this person must do the following operation n times while maintaining a sequence S, which is initially empty. So we have some sequence. Okay, and we do the following operation. Choose a card such that no other cards are hanging onto it. So choose a leaf. Append the number written on card X to the end of S. So if the parent is bigger than you, then the leaf. Replace the number on the card PX with the number on card X. Yeah, you get set to the minimum of your subtree, I guess. Yeah, it, it's hard to like explain in words, but in code, it's it's not too bad. I just like my my brain clicked, and now I see it. Next int. Oh wait. Wait a minute. Hang on a minute. You choose the permutation. Wait a minute. You choose a permutation. Whoa. You can choose the permutation yourself. Oh dang it. Okay, well, I know how to do it for a particular permutation. Let's go back to the drawing board then. Okay, um, dumb problem, but that's fine. All right, so in my opinion, uh, the version of this problem that they give in the contest is way more stupid than the version I misread, which is you're given the permutation. But I know lots of you are watching this video for the solution, so I'll just explain the real solution here anyway. Uh, basically, you can pick any subset of children for a node because they're all independent. So you can pick them in any order you want, uh, which means it's a simple tree DP. Either you can pick a node and its deepest path to one of its leaves, which is like its depth, or you can pick the sum of values in the children. So you can pick the sum of your children's values, but you can't take yourself in that case. And you just take the max of those two, and that's it. That's simple make an actual case here maybe because I don't think this tests the other way at all let's say we have four and they all have this as the parent three you can get all the children yeah I think that's right That's a dumb question. That's a really bad question. That doesn't belong in a div one plus div two round. It's a really bad question. Not because I, I did pretty well on it too. It's just like a very uninteresting question in my opinion. They should give you the permutation. It'd be so much more interesting. Um, okay. This person has an array A of n integers. For each one, uh, we'll write one element of the set AI on a whiteboard. In, after that, in one operation, this person may do the following. Choose two different sets on the whiteboard such that their intersection is empty. Wait, hang on. So for each I, you have the one element set AI. Okay. So you have a bunch of sets. Okay. Then in an operation, you pick two different sets that have no intersection. You erase them from the whiteboard and add their union. Okay. After performing zero more operations, he will construct a multi-set M containing the sizes of all sets written on the whiteboard. In other words, each element in M corresponds to the size of a set after the operations. How many multi-sets can be created? Hmm, I see. So we can compress these, obviously. Ah, N's kind of small too. The numbers only go up to square root.
and they could go higher. You could have one big. You could have everything in the same same set. Okay. Uh, we can do this, possibly. I don't know. We'll think about it. Let's get some paper. Oh, it's so late. It's 3 a.m., guys. I am not used to thinking at 3 a.m. 3 a.m., I'm supposed to be asleep. And we've got, what, two hours left. I'm going to be up till 5 a.m. Oof. Oof. So right about at this point is where you're probably wondering, Hey, David, wait a minute. I thought this was supposed to be a mildly entertaining YouTube video. Why are you boring us with all of this obscenely difficult to understand nonsense about multi-sets and counting things modulo almost a billion? That's hard to understand. So, uh, yeah, I, instead of trying to explain the solution to this problem here, which would take me several minutes, I'm doing it in a second video, which will be in a link in the description. It'll be unlisted, and you can view the solution to problem F there. The important parts are it's a pretty difficult to explain DP, and I figure out how to do it and then spend a long time coding it and debugging it. And we're going to fast through that because it's kind of boring. Oh, this will be group size minus one. New height. Oh my goodness, it's a seven. Is this one 11? That would be fun. Oh, I really don't want to debug this. Please just be right. That'd be so convenient. Be so convenient. Oh, it's gonna TLE. Oh, please don't TLE. Oh, please no. Please no. Please, I don't wanna, I don't wanna. Oh, goodness. Wait, I think that's actually amazing. Oh, two seconds. Thank goodness. Thank you for having mercy on me. 25th place, what's my predicted delta? We're performing like an LGM here, aren't we? Well, I'm, I'm kind of crushing it. I'm doing well. I guess on to G. Are there any hacks? That's a question. Should we start lock, locking stuff up? Hacking people? I guess we can try G, huh? Yeah, let's try G. Dangerous laser power. Yeah, I just don't know how to do this. This sounds obnoxious too. I have 30 minutes of a rated brown left, but I can't think, so I'm gonna go to sleep. And I'll see how I did tomorrow morning. Good night. So yeah, I went to bed about 45 minutes early because after all, it was 4 a.m., and I am not good at staying up that late. At the end of the day, my rank dropped a little bit. I ended up in 25th place, which honestly is better than I would have thought, considering I didn't solve anything after one hour, 30 minutes in a two hour, 45 minute contest. So I would have expected to drop quite a bit more than I did, but it turns out, I guess the last three problems were difficult for people to figure out. I ended up with a 130 rating boost, and I performed at the rating of a 2935. What that means is if I did an infinite number of contests, my rating would level off a little below LGM, which honestly is pretty good in my opinion. I'm pretty happy with that. I just need to improve a little bit more on my skills and then uh, just keep evaluating at that consistency, and that should be good. Um, however, one of the things I'm even more proud of than getting 25th place in the world, which in my opinion is pretty good, especially for a Div 1, Div 2 contest, is if you look at the people who beat me, we've got Kevin Sun from Canada, we've got Umnik, you'll notice nobody is from the United States, even including those people. Kevin is from Canada, but other than that, nobody's even from North America. So in this contest, I got second place in the Western Hemisphere, and first place in the country. Now, I have a YouTube channel, and there's one thing that will tell you for sure, which is because I think for whatever reason there's anyone on the internet who would enjoy watching me talk to a camera by myself, I clearly have an ego way bigger than it should be. So, what that means is to celebrate my second place finish in the new world and first place in the land of the free and home of the brave, I will be wearing this American flag representing the number one finisher for the rest of the video. Uh, we do have a couple quick announcements though. The road to LGM is not over. It will continue and grow onward and upward is the goal. Hopefully in a year we'll have more to show for it 
than a net negative 5 change in rating. In addition, if you're going to the 2019 to 2020 ICPC World Finals, held in 2022, of course, what other year would you think they would be held in? Uh, I will be there too in Dhaka. So Dhaka, Bangladesh. I'll be there for about a week. And if you see me, don't hesitate to say hi, shake hands if you'd like, take a picture. I will sign stuff. You don't need to feel weird about it. I ask tourists to do the same thing. Totally normal. So uh, I'll see you there if you're coming. And congrats on qualifying, by the way. Did I mention that? Well done if you did. It's a huge accomplishment. Uh, World Finals is a, is a very tough thing to get to. I honestly, when I started college, I didn't think I'd make it. But I got I, I lucked out, I guess. And uh, finally, Hacker Cup is coming up. So there will be slightly fewer videos than usual because Hacker Cup Finals is a ton of work. And I will be working on that. Um, I'll be focused a little bit more on it after World Finals, though, because I would want to be careful not to leak anything. All right, that's all. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.